Lord be with you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time to come together as a family. We thank you for restoring those of us to health that have been sick, and we thank you for bringing so many little ones back to the church. We ask that you continue to do so. I ask that you open our minds and our hearts to receive your word, that we may learn more about you, have our faith strengthened, and turn our focus upon Jesus. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God made me this way. This refrain is shouted over and over in our culture today. Normally, this is shouted to declare that if God made a person to be attracted to another person, regardless of who that person is, it should be accepted because God made them that way. Another sentiment shouted at the top of our lungs, the lungs of our culture is God wants me to be happy. This sentiment has behind it has been behind decisions to divorce a spouse, to leave kids behind, even to murder children in the womb. Our culture tries to use God to justify everything, from the dissolution of marriages to the murder of children to abominable practices such as the mutilation of the body simply to satisfy the internal strife brought upon by mental illness. What is at the core of this? A severe misunderstanding of the differences between trial and temptation. One comes from God, the other from the devil, the flesh, and the world. If you'll turn in your Bibles with me to the epistle of James, chapter 1, beginning with verse 12, we'll look to explain the differences between a trial or a testing and temptation. This desire to say that both come from God is nothing new, and oftentimes it is the result from failing to understand what sin actually is. Sin is a word that is practically taboo today, at least within churches. Our culture loves to point out the sin that they declare to be sin. Much of the conflict and difficulty we see within our culture today is simply a religion bowing down to the idol of political power. If you aren't within the orthodoxy, quote-unquote virtual, virtual signaling your support for the doctrine of the culture, then you risk cancellation or excommunication from the group as a whole. The culture declares what the Bible says is good to be evil and declares what the Bible says to be evil good. Then they have the nerve to declare to us that God made them this way so that they must live this way. But that isn't what Scripture tells us. Let's read the text. James writes in chapter 1, beginning at verse 12, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then the desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it fully, is fully grown, brings forth death. James is distinguishing for us here the difference between a trial and a temptation. A trial comes from God to test our faith, to purify us and to strengthen it within us, while temptation is born of our own flesh, the devil and the world. The devil has long been our enemy, leading humanity to follow ways and believe things that are not true so as to lead us to slavery, to sin and to rebellion against God Almighty that we might be destroyed along with him. The world and our flesh fell into sin with the sin of Adam, as Paul writes in Romans 5.12, though through one man entered, sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. In the Lutheran Confessions, the small called articles read, sin originated from one man, Adam. By his disobedience, all people were made sinners and became subject to death and the devil. This are called original or the chief sin. This is called the original or chief sin. The fruit of sin are the evil deeds that are forbidden in the Ten Commandments. This hereditary sin is a, such a deep corruption of nature that no reason can understand it. Our sinful flesh desires to commit sin. Our very desires and wants in our bodies are broken and corrupted by sin. We are created by God, yes, but because of the sin of Adam... We are conceived in sin as David wrote in Psalm 51. We cannot trust our desires 
because our flesh is still of Adam and we are still fallen. We who are in Christ are simultaneously justified yet sinner. Our spirits have been resurrected to life in Christ through baptism, but so long as our flesh lives, it still contains the sinful desires of Adam. Our temptations to sin do not come from God, but from at the Adam within our flesh and the lure of the devil and the world towards rebellion and slavery. So if our bodies and desires lead us towards same-sex attraction, or to believe that our bodies do not match the way our minds feel, or towards the desire to murder or divorce from anything, or anything else that is contrary to God's law given to us in scriptures, these are not temptations from God because sin does not originate from God. God did not make us this way. Our ancestor Adam did by falling into sin that has corrupted every human being who has ever lived or ever will live, save for one. God does not lead us to sin for he is sinless. He is incapable of being tempted to sin in his divinity. So what do we do with suffering? For though God does not tempt us to sin, he does most certainly test and try us through seasons of suffering in our lives to build and strengthen our faith. Just a few verses before this passage in James, in verse 2, James wrote that we should count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Every test and trial that we, ha we have endured has brought with it a measure of suffering. And suffering comes due to the consequences of sin. Either through our own sins or the sins of others or the overall sinful state of the world, suffering comes through the sins of man and the works of the devil. God does not cause sin, nor does he lead us to sin, but rather he allows us to sin to accomplish his overarching divine and hidden plan for humanity and the universe, it would be so very easily easy to have not allowed Adam and Eve to survive, to have children, but rather to kill them and on the spot and start from scratch when they fell. It would have been so very easy to not allow so many of us to be born into sin, to be born into temptations to debauchery, depravity, and disobedience. But God allows each of us to be born for his purposes. Why? Because in his abundant and great mercy and loving kindness, he allows us to be born that we might have the opportunity to be saved through Jesus, his son, Jesus Christ. It is better to have been given the chance for salvation than to have never existed at all. I will not pretend to understand the purpose behind God's plan, nor will I presume to tell you what I think is God's will behind every moment of suffering. No human being, save Christ, has the ability or the authority to look over God's shoulder and see how or why he does the things that he does or allows things to happen. What I do know is that God's will is that all might be saved through his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. He does not lead us to temptation. He does not dangle sin and evil before us to lead us astray, though he does allow the devil, the world, and our flesh to tempt us. He tests us, tests our faith, just as he did Abraham's faith with Isaac, to strengthen our faith. If we look at the story of Abraham in Genesis chapter 22, we are told of God's testing of Abraham's faith. This is not a temptation to sin, for it is not a sin to do what God commands us to do. Abraham goes forth in faith to obey God's command to offer his son Isaac as a burnt offering before the Lord. He understands that this is a test even if he doesn't fully understand why. He knows and trusts in God and his promises to him, trusting in the very character of God that he has revealed to him to provide a proper sacrifice in keeping with God's mercy, loving kindness, and faithfulness. God knows that Isaac is the child of the promise that God has made to him. Abraham knows this. Abraham knows that God is all-powerful and mighty and able to do anything. Abraham trusts so completely that he tells his servants that both he and Isaac would return in chapter 22, verse 5. He says, both of us will return. 
and God is faithful. He stops Abraham from sacrificing Isaac and provides a ram instead to be sacrificed and renews his covenant with Abraham. Abraham doesn't flee from the test. He doesn't trust in anyone or anything other than God. Even believing that if he did sacrifice Isaac, God would raise him from the dead, as the author of Hebrews tells us in chapter 11, verse 19. God tested Abraham's faith, and by God's grace, his faith stood the test. We are combatants in a war, my brothers and sisters. A war that started long ago. And we became targets at the moment of our baptism. We see in our gospel reading of Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 15, how Jesus modeled for us just what this looks like for us as Christians, even as he sanctified the waters of baptism and gave us this sacrament. Jesus is baptized and begins his ministry as king, high priest, and prophet, his ministry as Messiah. Immediately after his baptism, he is led into the wilderness and temptation he is tempted by sinless, excuse me, he is, he, Jesus emerges from the wilderness after being subjected to the attacks of the devil as Satan tempts him. He emerges sinless, defeating Satan with God's written word in a foreshadowing of Satan's eventual defeat by the word made flesh through Jesus' own sacrifice upon the cross. Jesus goes from the wilderness to carry out the ministry and the battle for the world by calling the entire world to repentance, proclaiming the coming of the kingdom of God and calling all to repent and believe in the gospel. When we were baptized, we became soldiers in our fight, combatants in the cosmic war between God and Satan that has already been won, even though we have yet to taste the final victory. We became subject to Satan's temptation to sin as he stirs up the sinful desires of the flesh and brings the weight of the world's lies to lure us and lead us astray from our King and Savior and back into sin and death. And just as soldiers are trained and tested by their superiors, so we too are tested and trained by God through our various trials and tribulations so that we are made perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, as James writes in chapter 1, verse 4. How do we fight back against these temptations and endure the trials that we are subjected to? We follow the examples of Abraham and Christ. We trust wholly and completely in God, who he has revealed himself to be. Call upon him in prayer for help in our affliction and difficulties. Trust in his word and sacraments to protect and defend us and work perfection within us. And go out to proclaim the gospel to the world. We constantly, daily, die to ourselves and put on Christ that we might put the deeds of the body to death through the Holy Spirit, as Paul writes in Romans 8.13. The world and the culture would have us believe that we are born a certain way, and therefore we are forever bound to live according to how we are born. We are born into cultures, and then we must be forever victims. We are born with certain desires, so then we must forever live according to them. The world says we are born to be happy, so we must cast off anything that does not bring us happiness when we hit various trials. But these things are not of God. These are, not the, these are the temptations of the devil, the flesh, and the world. You were born a certain way, so that God, but not so that you might live that way, but so that God might save you from that way and bring you to know how he intended you to be. You were born into a certain culture that you might meet Jesus and through his gospel bring healing and life. For there are no differences of culture, no Jew or Greek, nor male or female in the church of Christ. All are equal before the throne of God, especially requi equally requiring God's grace through the blood of Jesus Christ. You were born with certain desires, but you are not required to live according to them, for your slavery to sin and desires can be broken through Jesus Christ. If those desires persist after your baptism, then you are blessed with the ability to remain single so that you can be wholly devoted to Christ Jesus and his ministry upon the earth. You were not born to be happy, but to worship God in joy and praise, glorying in him forever. You don't have to end a marriage when things get tough or see the baby in your belly as a curse because of how he or she came to be in there or because of how tight money is. God is faithful 
He will provide for you and your child and for your, you and your husband or wife. And even the child is a blessing for you in the midst of hardship. Your marriage is a blessing for you in the midst of hardship, even when things are tough. Our God does not create us for sin. He does not tempt us or intend for us to live in sin. He does not bring evil upon us, but rather through our sins and the sins of others, we bring evil upon ourselves. God tests us to perfect us and make our faith stronger so that we depend wholly and completely upon him through Christ Jesus, his son, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Satan tempts us through his wiles and through the desires of our flesh and the fallen state of the world. He wants our destruction and tempts us toward it. He, God wants our salvation and our sanctification and tests us to help bring it about. So how then do we deal with the temptation and the trial? Does the success depend upon our work? No, may it never be. We can no more be successful in trial or temptation based on our own work than we can be saved by it. So who is at work when we're, whose work are we made to endure through trial and resist temptation? By the work of Christ Jesus alone. Paul writes in Romans chapter 4, beginning at verse 20 through chapter 5, verse 10. No distrust made him, Abraham, waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his, his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who were raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we, now, we have now been justified his, by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. Abraham grew strong in his faith concerning the promise of God, giving him glory for his favor and trusting wholly in his promises. We have been justified by faith through God the Son, Christ Jesus, so that we have access to God the Father by the power of God the Holy Spirit. And we can cry out to him for help in our temptation and strength in our trials. We can rejoice when we suffer, for we know that in our suffering, God is further perfecting us and bringing us to complete dependence upon him. We can trust that we have been saved by Christ from the wrath of God, so that even as we suffer, we know that God will save us from the sufferings and temptations and trials of this world and bring us into his presence by the righteousness of Christ Jesus, which is now our righteousness. If you are tempted to sin, flee and cry out to God to save you from that temptation so that you will not fall into sin. If you are suffering under the weight of trials, then cry out to God for deliverance and provision by virtue of your baptism into Christ and the righteousness of his sacrifice for you. Whatever your struggle, let your struggle drive you to Jesus. However you may feel you were born, cry out to God who is always faithful, and let him do the work in you that needs to be done so that you can endure steadfastly. And one day in his presence, receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who trust him. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that you have not left us. You have not left us dead in our sin. You have not let, destroyed us and started from scratch. We thank you for letting us exist, for giving us the life that we borrow from you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who saves us through his sacrifice from our sin 
and from our death and from the devil and the world. We thank you for your work on our behalf. We thank you for not leaving us as our orphans, abandoned to temptation, for giving us your word and sacraments that we might be strengthened in faith and that we might proclaim your son, Jesus Christ, for all the world to hear. Lord, when we groan under the trials and sufferings of this world, let us drive ourselves to you. Let that drive us to you, that we might call upon you and be saved, that we might depend wholly on you for your provision, for your care, for your comfort. And when we are tempted, let us discern quickly where that temptation comes from, flee from it, and to cry out to you to save us from it. For we are powerless as children. Lord, we thank you so much. And we proclaim, we submit ourselves to you. We call upon you that we might be saved. And we all ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit is worshiped and glorified, one God, forever and ever. Amen.